Okay. Have you got me on camera? Yes. All right. Very good. Welcome, everybody, to the class. Those of you that are here and those of you that may be in a far away places. Let me also choose another camera here so we can get our computer content up on the other screen. You got the computer? Yep. We did have. Okay. There it is. No. Let's see here. Don't have it? Do have it. There you go. We do have it. Very good. First, first thing I'd like to cover as we introduce the book of Galatians is uh, the background of the book, of course. Uh, there are several things I'd like to start with, and one of them is, is uh, Paul's early life. But before we do that, I'd like you to write down about four theological principles that we're going to come back to over and over again uh, in the book of Galatians. The first one that this book is very important for is it discusses the basic nature of the gospel. The basic theological nature of the gospel. Now the idea of what is the gospel? What is the basic nature of the gospel? What's the basic content of the gospel? And it keeps going back to the fact that the gospel is a message of faith and grace. It is a message of faith and grace. And if we distort that, if we make us another type of thing central to the gospel, then we've perverted it. And that's what was going on in uh, the book of Galatians. Another very uh, closely related theological principle in Galatians is the centrality of Christ and his redemptive work to the gospel message. The centrality of Christ and his redemptive work to the gospel message. Anytime the gospel message ceases to be primarily about Christ and his redemptive work, then uh, we're not really dealing with the New Testament gospel. Third great principle that we'll come back to over and over again is the need to refrain from requiring what Christ has not required for salvation and fellowship. The need to refrain from requiring what Christ has not required for salvation and for fellowship. Another way to put this, which is often misunderstood, is freedom in Christ. What does freedom in Christ mean? And then finally, the great theological principle of the book of Galatians, the purpose of the law bringing us to Christ. And the book of Galatians works very hard to establish that particular purpose. Okay, in Acts 22, 3, Paul said he was a Jew from Tarsus of Cilicia. He was raised at the feet of Gamaliel. And uh, one of the, the things that this book centers in on is Paul and who Paul is and what in the world Paul is doing preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. Paul was raised in the heart of Ju uh, Judaism. He was raised in the city of uh, Tarsus of Cilicia. Tarsus of Cilicia was a Roman city, a Roman colony, and uh, Paul was a Roman citizen. Later in his life, this would not only enable him to appeal to Caesar, but would enable many doors to be opened to him, travel and to... Uh, have uh, Congress with different types of people where he could share the gospel. And uh, he was raised in this Tarsus of Cilicia as a Jew among the Pharisees. And his training was uh, under one of the major Tanahitic rabbis, the grandson of Hillel the Elder, uh, uh, Gamaliel. Uh, Tarsus, if you look at the map here, is located in Cilicia, and you'll notice Cilicia is uh, relative to Pamphylia on the coast, Cappadocia to the north, and Galatia to the north. 
and some of these territories sort of blend in uh, one with another. There was a big mountain range right by Tarsus that would have to be crossed in order to get over into the area where the Galatian correspondence is uh, relative to. But this Gamaliel, the school under, uh, was the grandson of the great Jewish teacher Hillel the Elder. And those of you that are familiar with the Mishnah, the teachings of the rabbis from 200 B.C. to 200 A.D., Gamaliel was a leading teacher in that era. He was a leading authority in the Sanhedrin court in the mid-first century. And Gamaliel died nine years before the destruction of Jerusalem, around A.D. 61. And uh, Gamaliel and Paul's life overlapped uh, quite a bit. And you remember the, the story in the book of Acts where Gamaliel... Uh, discouraged them from trying to fight against God if this movement was really from God. And so a lot of interesting uh, tie-ins there to uh, Jewish tradition. But Paul was the most Jewish of Jews. And the thing is, the very history of Paul himself is one of the most convicting things about the gospel and why Paul was preaching the gospel. And the book of Galatians is about the fact that Paul couldn't help doing what he was doing that he hasn't, hadn't really chosen to do what he was doing, but it had chosen him, and God had chosen him to do it. Uh, Paul was among the Pharisees. He was a Pharisee. And uh, the Pharisees were a group of people. The Hebrew word parushim comes from parash, which means to separate. The Pharisees were the separated ones that... Uh, <coughs> chose to obey the laws of the priests and were the main teachers in the synagogues. And the uh, collation or the collection of the teaching of the Pharisees from 200 B.C. to 200 A.D. is what we have in the Mishnah. So uh, much of the thought background in the book of Galatians, in the Gospels, etc., from the Jews comes from the Mishnah. And all of you should have Herbert Danby's uh, translation of the Mishnah in your library as a resource book. So uh, you can uh, look at the teachings of the Jews and, and be a little bit more familiar with the teachings of the Jews relative to certain matters in the New Testament. It's a good resource book for your library. Paul, uh, of course, became part of the Sanhedrin court himself as he advanced in uh, Judaism. We know this because as he talks about persecuting the Christians, he says in Acts 26.10, I cast my vote against them. Well, in order to have a vote, you had to be a member of the Sanhedrin court. And uh, Paul had certainly raised very high in Judaism and the traditions of the Jews. And uh, he's going to talk about that more as we get into uh, the actual text of Galatians. Paul's uh, earlier uh, life after conversion uh, is uh, looked at in the book of Acts, of course. In Acts 9, you have his initial conversion and in Acts 9.15 remember where Ananias was so afraid to go to see Paul and, and God said to him or Jesus said to him go thy way for he's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles the kings and the children of Israel so Paul was baptized and God had chosen him to be the sharer of the gospel with the Gentiles even that went against all Jewish culture and tradition and yet Christ had chosen Paul to do that. And then you'll remember in Acts 11 when uh, some people came and brought the gospel to uh, Antioch that Barnabas was called to go to Antioch and Barnabas uh, saw what God was doing in Antioch and Barnabas sent to Tarsus and called for Paul and brought him to Antioch and there they gathered together for a whole year and taught much people and the disciples were called what? Christians. Anybody out there? Christians. First at Antioch. Okay? So Antioch of Syria was a, a major uh, jumping off place in the ministry of Paul. And uh, Paul tells about his conversion, of course, in Acts 9, Acts 16, and Acts 22. And uh, alludes to it again in Acts 26. And uh, all of those places he refers to that Damascus Road experience that changed his life and brought him to be where he was, preaching the gospel to these people in the region that we call Galatia. Now, the, the book of Galatians most likely concerns the material that you find in Acts 
uh, 13 and 14 and 15. And Acts 13, remember it was at Antioch that the Holy Spirit said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. And then they went into this region and uh, they came to uh, Antioch of Pisidia and Lystra and Derbe and Iconium and all the incidents that happened in Acts chapter 13 and Acts chapter 14 uh, took place. And then there was the great controversy in Acts 15 that probably led to the events that uh, uh, spawned the book of Galatians because certain Jews came down from Judea and said, unless a man be circumcised, he cannot be saved. And, of course, that's one of the basic uh, ideas that we're working with in the book of Galatians. So these are probably the uh, churches that we're concerned with when Paul writes the churches of Galatia. There may be others. You'll notice Galatia is traditionally uh, the term that's given to those uh, areas that are a little bit north of these. This area was sometimes taken in under the term uh, Galatia. And we'll talk about that some more in just a little bit. These are the Tarsus Mountains. These mountains that one had to cross by land to go from Tarsus and Cilicia over into the area of Galatia. It was a very rugged area. Uh, and it's what's now southern Turkey. And uh, one had to cross these to reach that, that range back in those days. This is the site of Antioch of Pisidia where uh, Paul went to the synagogue in the 13th chapter of Acts. And remember in Acts chapter 13, uh, if you have your Bibles there, turn them to Acts chapter 13. The synagogue and the, the culture of the synagogue has a lot to do with Paul and the background of Paul because the Pharisees were the teachers of the synagogue. Paul was a Pharisee. The Sadducees were the priests. Their area was the temple, in the temple area. But the Pharisees were in the synagogue, and they were the teachers of the people. Look at Acts 13, beginning with verse 14. It says, From Perga they went on to Pisidian Antioch, and on the Sabbath they entered the synagogue and sat down. And after the reading from the law and the prophets, the synagogue rulers sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have a message of encouragement for the people, please speak. Synagogue service was usually one where it began with the Shema, you know, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, etc. And then they would say some prayers or benedictions or blessings, whatever you would call them. Jewish forms of blessings like something like, Blessed be thou, O Lord our God, King of the earth, who bringeth forth bread from the earth, or whatever else they were praying about. And then there would be a reading from the law. And there were sections of the law divided for every Sabbath day so that a section of the law could be read each Sabbath day and that could be preached on. And then the prophets were also divided into sections uh, to be uh, read on each Sabbath day. And so it was traditional that after the reading of the law of the prophets, somebody would be asked to speak and somebody would teach on the sections of Scripture that were written. And Paul, of course, fell right into this, and the city in Antioch uh, rose up to speak and gave his lesson, which brought Old Testament history uh, into the time of Christ and God's redemptive plan in the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is Antioch of Pisidia. Remember, they also went to places like Lystra, where there were pagans, and the pagans uh, tried to believe that uh, Paul and his companion were Zeus and Hermes and they uh, wanted to sacrifice animals to them and Paul ended up getting stoned and all of this happened there in, in uh, the passage in Acts. And uh, again, this shows you the, the places that they went to. And remember in the end of Acts 14, about 22, they, de they determined to return to all those places that they had preached the gospel in Galatia. And uh, they ordained elders for them in every church and commended them to the Lord. And then they returned to Antioch, from which they had left. And I want you to look carefully at one passage with me at the end of Acts 14, because this is really important to, to Paul's whole mentality about 
the work he had done in Galatia. Acts 14, verse 27. Acts 14, 27. It says, on arriving there, it's talking about Antioch of Syria, now back to where they started. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported, now watch this part, all that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith for the Gentiles. This wasn't something Paul had done. This wasn't something Paul had contrived to do. This wasn't even something Paul necessarily had wanted to do. This is something that God had done through him. And God had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And one of his main concerns in writing the book of Galatians is to show that God did this stuff, that God pointed him in this direction, that God did the work of Christ, that God sent him to the Gentiles, that God was the one who was working behind all of this and not simply a renegade Jew that went off the reservation and did things that he wasn't supposed to do. So uh, this is very important in understanding uh, the background of the book of Galatians. And, uh, of course, here in this passage, uh, we're talking about that same uh, same passage, and I didn't have it up on the screen, but the important part is in verse 27, all that God had done through them, and how he had opened the door of faith uh, to the Gentiles. That's what... Uh, the emphasis here was. I'd like to spend a couple of minutes uh, just putting the book of Galatians in some kind of historical perspective for you. Uh, We're talking about uh, a time that is uh, probably 10 or 15 years. We don't know exactly how many years after the uh, death of Christ. Jesus was crucified probably about A.D. 29 by our present calendar. And, uh, of course, the writings of the Jews, the Pharisees, their teachings were prominent at that time uh, in, the, in the teachings of the Mishnah. Gamaliel was still alive, as we had said. Some of the great rabbis were, were still teaching and very strong in Jerusalem. And uh, Judaism was still very strong. And Christianity developed and rose out of Judaism. Jesus was a Jew. All the apostles were Jews. Excuse me, and certainly Saul of Tarsus was a Jew in a sense that none of the apostles were because he was a leader of the Jews. He was a Sanhedrin member. He was in the higher up of the Jews. Uh, Pontius Pilate lived from A.D. 26 to A.D. 36. And so he probably had already been deposed by the time of, of uh, the writing of Galatians, sent back to Rome because of what he did to the Samaritans. And uh, the initial spread of Christianity that you read about in the book of Acts had been taking place. Uh, the spread to the Samaritans, the spread to uh, the people out in Antioch of Syria, uh, the people who went everywhere preaching the word. Uh, there were apostles and prophets in the churches, evangelists that were teaching. They, the elders and deacons began to be appointed in the ancient churches as they were established in by the time of the writing of the book of Galatians, things were still being established, and a lot of this was still being put in place. Uh, in AD 70, of course, you had the Jewish rebellion and Jew- Jerusalem destroyed. Uh, this probably was 20 or more years after the writing of the book of Galatians, and so the book of Galatians would be in between the cross and here. Uh, then, of course, you had Flavius Josephus, one of our uh, historians from that time that would have been a little later in the first century around the time of the destruction of Jerusalem. And uh, uh, by the time of the destruction of Jerusalem, the churches probably already had collected in their personal libraries three of the Gospels at least, the book of Acts, Pauline epistles, including this book of Galatians, and those books right there. And then, of course, John did his writings in the very last part of the first century. And uh, the book of Revelation in the time of Domitian was written there. And then you have uh, early Christian documents like First Clement and Didache. So that kind of gives you a, a uh, historical framework for where the book of Galatians belongs and 
you could kind of stick it right in there after the apostles and prophets and evangelists up on that timeline uh, about 20 years or so before the destruction of Jerusalem. Okay, now before we go any further with that, uh, let's uh, have a question or two or three. I need to choose a different camera here real quick so I can see the students over there in Denver. Somebody, let's see here, I need to get the far camera. Which camera is the students? One or two? <coughs> Wayne or Mike or somebody or Minnie? They're all gone. I'm here, but... Um, no, not that, Wayne. All of them are gone. Okay, well, y'all can see me. Y'all can see me, and that's the important thing. That's all right. Okay, now who has a question? You'll have to say it out loud. I'm going to question. Dan? Yes. Did you, did you say that um, Christ being crucified around AD 29, that would place the writing of the book of Galatians somewhere around uh, 15 years after that? It's, a, it's just a wild guess, 15 to 20. Something like that, yeah. Other questions? Don't be bashful. Is the book of Galatians probably the first book that was recorded? Well, I'd like to underline the word probably. Uh, we don't know. The book of James may have been the first one uh, that was written. The book of Galatians has a good shot at it, however, because of where it's placed. If you look at the Acts narrative, the book of Galatians had to be somewhere around... Uh, the uh, uh, oh the, the Council of Jerusalem, and that was before the Church of Philippi was established, and a bunch of those things. So before the Church of Corinth was established, had to be pretty early. Um, somebody, uh, Wayne Berger, can you can you get a hold of that? Uh, let me see if I can manipulate Charles' camera. Here, just a minute. I want to be able to see the class that I'm talking to. You, you can't see the class now? I can't see the class. Okay, let me go get Wayne Nelson or somebody. Okay. Very good. Maybe it's because it's recording that we can't do that. But anyway, go ahead. Who else has a question? Anybody on this end have a question? Brother Antoine, Brother Mark? No. Mark? All right. Okay, well, if nobody has a question, <clears throat> then uh, we'll keep on trucking here. <clears throat> In Galatians chapter 1, as we start into the uh, text, we want to look at several things. In the first verse, he says, Paul, an apostle, notice he says, not from men, neither through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. Just as in the book of Acts, his point was that this wasn't his doing. This, this wasn't his intention. He's making the point that his very apostleship was not his doing, it was God's doing. His mission as a missionary to the Gentile <clears throat> was not his doing, it was uh, God's doing. Right down there next to that verse, Acts 9.15, where uh, Jesus told Ananias, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel to bear my name before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And uh, so, Sam, yes. Uh, got my kite here. <clears throat> you can't, you can't see us? And try, try choosing your camera again for the, for the students and see if that helps. I'm wondering if because I'm recording these two things that it won't let me see. But try it one time and see what happens. recording the class, so we'll just let it go like it is. <clears throat> you guys can see me, though, right? Yes, sir. Okay, that's all that matters. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, his point that it's not from man or through man, but through Jesus Christ, is key to the argument of this book, because he wants to impress upon his readers that it's not him, but it's God that's driving all of this. Acts 9.15, where Ananias was told, 
He is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name to the Gentiles. And then if you look over in Romans chapter 11, Romans chapter 11, there's a great deal of interplay between Romans and Galatians. In Romans 11 verse 13, Paul says, I speak to you who are Gentiles, by however so much I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I glorify my ministry. So Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles. He didn't make it that way. He's the one that uh, submitted to what God told him God wanted him to do. And if you look at Galatians chapter 2, turn over to Galatians chapter 2. And there if you uh, look at verse 9, where Paul meets finally with the primary leaders of the Jerusalem church, it says, And knowing the grace which was given to me, and there he means the gift of his being an apostle, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and to Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go unto the Gentiles, and they unto the circumcision. So even the great apostles and leaders in Jerusalem acknowledged that God had called Paul to go preach the gospel to the Gentiles. <clears throat> so as he uh, prepares these people in this epistle uh, to answer what he needs to answer, he's emphasizing very strongly that this wasn't him. This was God who called him to be an apostle and gave him this ministry. Then he says, And all the brethren that are with me under the churches of Galatia, you could translate that the assemblies of Galatia. Churches were groups of people that had been established that were meeting in those areas that we talked about in Acts 13 and 14 and over whom Paul had appointed elders in every group that assembled. By the way, uh, the assembly, the worship assembly on Sunday morning is that which defines a church. And an eldership is supposed to be under one worship, uh, over one worship assembly. And churches are supposed to meet together. In the next verse, he says, Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. Now see, <clears throat> right at the beginning, not only does he give the Jewish and, and Greek greeting to people, grace, charis, to the Greeks, shalom, peace to the Jews, but he emphasizes Christ who gave himself for our sins. See, what is the answer to sin? How are our sins forgiven? How are we saved? It's through Christ, see? And it says that he, Christ, might deliver us out of this present evil world. It's not by the law. It's not by keeping the law. It's not by some set of Pharisaic traditions. It's Christ that delivers us. And this was not according to Paul's will. But again, he says, according to the will of our God and Father. Compare the according to the will of our God and Father... Back to what you have back in the earlier verse back here where he says, Not from men, neither through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. And now again he says, This is according to the will of God and the Father. This is what God did. God sent Christ. God redeemed man through Christ. God said that it would be by grace through Christ. Not some man. It was God's plan. And that's what Paul wants them to know. Uh, <clears throat> In verse 6, Paul gets down to really uh, the reason for the writing of the book of Galatians. And this is a passage that we're going to uh, spend a lot of time on. <clears throat> Paul says, I marvel that you are so quickly removing yourselves from the one who called you in the grace of Christ unto a different gospel. Now, the grace of Christ here is underlined because the nature of the gospel, the basic character of the gospel, uh, the basic theological emphasis of the gospel is the grace of Christ. It's the grace that was created by Christ, that comes from Christ, that the redemptive work of Christ is the basis of that grace. It's all about grace. It's a gospel of grace, see? And that's the gospel that Paul preached. He taught people to put their faith in Christ, not to put their faith in traditions or the law or whatever else, but in Christ. So these people had been called to put their faith in Christ, but they were deserting Him, and they were going into uh, listening to a different gospel. Now the word different is the word heteron. 
If you look at this uh, passage here, you see the Greek text on the screen. Can you guys see that all right there in Denver? Yes. Okay. You see at the end of the first line, uh, heteron, euangelion, the different gospel. This is, this is the word for another of a different kind. It's like heterosexual versus homosexual. Hetero means a different kind. Homo means the same kind. That says you've been removing yourselves unto a different kind of the gospel. What's different is, according to the context here, it's not about the grace of Christ anymore. That's what makes it a different gospel, see? And then he says, which is not another. You see the little alo, alpha, lambda, lambda, uh, omicron, alo? That's the word for another of the same kind. He says it's not another of the same kind because it's not about grace anymore. So if you go back to the, the English text here, he says it's a different gospel, which is not another. It's not another of the same kind. The reason is it's not a gospel of grace. That's what the people were changing. It's not about Christ primarily. It was about law keeping and personal keeping of traditions and so forth. And uh, when we teach people, when we preach to people, uh, we need to make sure that, that the gospel that we're preaching is not a different gospel in the sense that it's all about Christ and the relationship with Christ and, and sustaining the grace of Christ and that it's not about perfection but it's about the cleansing of sin that comes through the blood of Christ. So he says this gospel was not really another of the same kind. Only there are some who are disturbing you. Now this group of people, whoever they are, is first referred to here in this verse as some who are troubling you or some who are disturbing you. Now, later on, they're referred to in, in different ways, especially in chapter 6 as he wraps up this epistle. But there were people like the people in Acts 15, remember, that came down and said, unless you are circumcised, you cannot be saved. Unless you're circumcised after the custom of Moses. So whoever these strongly Judaizing type teachers were, they were disturbing the people of the Galatian churches. And they were trying to distort or pervert or change the gospel of Christ. And notice back up in verse 6, he says it's a different gospel. And at the end of verse 7, it says they're distorting or perverting the gospel of Christ. Now see, notice that the gospel of Christ, down there <clears throat> at the bottom of verse 7, euangelion to Christu, is what he meant when he talked about it in verse 6, the one who calls you in the grace of Christ. See, the grace of Christ and the gospel of Christ, those are the same thing. It's a gospel of grace. It's a gospel of forgiveness in Christ. But this different gospel is not really a gospel that has Christ at the center. There are other things, there are other considerations that are at the center of that, that are at the basis of that, that are at the foundation of that, other than Christ and his redemptive work and his lordship. Okay, anybody have any questions you want to ask on that end at this point? I'll open it up for a minute or two. You have to speak up because I can't see. I'm going to take that as a no. Okay. Anybody on this end? Okay. We'll go on then. Now, remember that the Pharisees had uh, come down to now, the people in this area and had said, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. The question that was before these people was, what is the basis of salvation? What is the gospel? You know, What is the real uh, heart of the matter as far as the message of Christ is concerned? And they were saying that some of these customs of Moses were at the heart of the matter. And of course, Paul and others were saying that they were not. Then Paul goes on to say, but though we or an angel from heaven should preach to you any gospel other than that which we preach to you. Notice the, the word gospel here and how prominent it is. If you go back uh, earlier uh, to verse 6, uh, he says, you know, 
It's a different gospel that you're moving to. Verse 7, you're distorting the gospel of Christ. And here again he says, you're going to preach any other gospel other than that which we preach unto you. Any other gospel in this context goes back to the different gospel, which is something different than the grace of Christ. And so he says, anybody that does that, let him be anathema. This anybody, I suppose, refers back to those who were troubling you and uh, distorting or perverting the gospel of Christ. Uh, he's talking in context about anyone that would switch the emphasis, the theological emphasis of the gospel. I think many times we may preach correct facts about the gospel sometimes, but we may be guilty of switching or distorting the emphasis of the gospel where that, uh, uh, for example, and, and don't misunderstand what I'm saying, baptism is absolutely necessary for salvation. And we must be baptized in order to be baptized into Christ and all that. That's, that's not even a question. But many people, they just preach the five steps. Here, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. And they don't really preach Christ. They don't really preach that Christ and His redemptive work is the salvation of man. And it's Christ that we're putting our trust in. And baptism is the thing that gets us into Christ. And it's only in trusting Christ in baptism that our sins are washed away because of the blood of Christ. And then after we're baptized, it's sustaining a relationship with who? With Christ that keeps us in fellowship with God. And what's the center of the gospel? It's not baptism, but it's what? It's Christ, see? And so if, if we don't teach that emphasis, we may be guilty of uh, and, and especially if our emphasis in preaching doesn't bring everything back to Christ, then we may be guilty of the same kind of distortion before long that the people were in uh, the time of Galatia that were emphasizing Judaism. And notice, other than that which we preached unto you, the apostles, Paul, namely, was an apostle, and the teaching of the apostles, the gospel of the apostles, was the litmus test. Uh, several passages in Paul's writings talk about this. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 15. Hold to the traditions which you receive from us, whether by word or by letter. Or uh, uh, you might go to 1 John 4, verse 6, for the old apostle John. He that is from God listens to us. He that is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So the apostles who were with Jesus... And they saw firsthand the redemptive work of Jesus. But those apostles, even Paul, who came later, emphasized that in their preaching of the gospel. Then he repeats it, as we have said before, so say I now again, if any man preaches to you any other gospel other than that which you received, let him be anathema, separated from God. Now, the whole term gospel, we need to spend a little time here on this. The whole term gospel is one that uh, especially people among churches of Christ uh, need to get their heads around. There are four documents in the New Testament that are called Gospels. Those documents, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, deal with what? They deal with Christ. They deal with the birth of Christ, the ministry of Christ, the preaching and teaching of Christ, the passion narratives which are a significant part of the Gospels deal with the redemptive work of Christ, which is uh, the, the heart and soul of the Gospel, the mission of Christ, to seek and save the lost. So the Gospel is about Christ. Uh, <clears throat> the book of Mark begins, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, Son of God, and it ends by saying, go into all the world and preach the what? Preach the Gospel to every creature. So the Gospel is the message of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 Verse 1 is a, is a key passage about uh, the gospel. Uh, there Paul says, I declare to you, brothers, the gospel that was preached unto you, which also you received. Notice he says you received it, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. In which also you stand, by which also you were saved. If you hold fast the word that uh, I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. Then he talks about the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus and, and centers on the importance of the resurrection. 
the gospel again. The gospel of Jesus and what the implications of the gospel are. Paul's writing, you know, Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. The redemptive message of Christ. It is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. The Jew first and also to the Gentile. In this particular passage, in, in Galatians, <coughs> excuse me, you'll notice that uh, down here at the, at the uh, verse 8, he says, a gospel other than that which we preach, talking about Paul and the, his companions, and then in, in verse 9, other than that which you received. This word uh, received is an important word. And uh, if you look down there at the bottom, you can see the Greek text all right there, guys? Yes. Okay. If you look down at the bottom, you see the word paralabete there in the, in the last verse, gospel which you received. That word paralambano, paralabete is a form of it, paralambano, is a word which means to receive from somebody. In the whole idea of the passing down of tradition, a tradition is something that you pass down, somebody passes it down, and then somebody on the other end receives it from somebody. And this is the word that is used when, it, when it's talking about, you know, receiving a tradition that is a, a religious teaching. And when it talks about divine traditions in Paul's writings, he uses this word, for example. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, the gospel which you received, and he uses this same word. Uh, Paul uses this in 1 Corinthians 11, 23, when he says, I received from the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. And he uses this word paralambano, which means to receive a sacred tradition, to receive a tradition. Okay? But this word is important here because it's a valid religious tradition that was received from the apostle, handed to the apostle by God, and received from the apostle by the people. And so he says, you know, if anyone preaches a different gospel other than what you received, he means you received it as holy tradition, you received it as uh, a divine tradition. Same terminology in <clears throat> uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse uh, 15 where he says, Hold to the traditions which you received from us, whether by word or by letter. So this word paralambano, received from, is very important in the whole idea of uh, accepting a tradition, a divine uh, tradition. Uh, this is the word that we're talking about here. And uh, uh, this is the word that is very important here in, in Galatians and in a lot of the writings of Paul that has to do with with the acceptance and receiving of uh, divine traditions. Dan? Uh, yes, they got a question. Yes, this is Randy Corey. Um, you've been talking a lot about and defining gospel as pretty much, I guess, would be the work of Christ or what Christ has done and accomplished. Yes. Uh, but in 2 Thessalonians 1.8, we have, um, you, you have to obey the gospel. Yes. Um, that's what we do in response to it. That's right. But uh, is that how it's used here in Galatians? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. The gospel includes the terms of obedience, the terms of, of uh, coming into Christ. And it includes all of that in Galatians. But what I'm trying to say is uh, that the term, now listen carefully, the term gospel as it is used in the epistles of Paul and in the New Testament does not refer to the entirety of the content of the New Testament. What the term gospel refers to is the redemptive message of Christ and the work of Christ and how a man incorporates that work of Christ into his life, which includes, of course, baptism and all the rest, that's the gospel. Now, there's a bigger word that refers to all divinely inspired teaching, and that's the word didache, which means doctrine or teaching. All of God's inspired word is didache, it's doctrine, it's teaching. But there is a subset of that, which is referred to by the word gospel. The gospel is the 
core teaching about the redemptive work of Christ and how we relate to the redemptive work of Christ. And this is simply talking about how a word is used in the Bible. Other questions about that? Okay, very good. So Paul, uh, after having said this about some people were preaching a different gospel, it wasn't about the grace of Christ, you know, and how that if it was a different gospel than they preached or it was a gospel other than what was received, a person was to be accursed if they were uh, teaching it. Those were pretty strong words. Then he says, am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? Uh, if you compare verse 10, if you're looking at your Bible in Galatians, turn over to Galatians 6. Galatians 6. Look at verse 12. Here Paul's talking about some people that were trying to please men. He says, As many as wish to make a fair showing in the flesh... These are the ones who compel you to be circumcised, only that they might not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For not even they themselves are circumcised, nor do they keep the law, but they wish you to be circumcised so that they may boast the more in your flesh. See, these people were trying to please men. They were trying to play politics. They were trying to please the Jewish Christians who were more into the Jewish than they were the Christian. They were trying to please the, the Pharisee, Pharisees who wanted to emphasize law-keeping instead of emphasizing Christ. They wanted to emphasize Jewish tradition instead of emphasizing Christ. Paul was not of that sort. And Paul had been severely persecuted by the Jews, the main source of his persecution. And so Paul said, am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? And of course, the men he refers to are primarily these Judaizers and those that would uh, find Jewish traditions on people. Now, as we think through the book of Galatians and as we, as we think about how we're going to preach the book of Galatians, you know, we can easily fail to apply this by saying, well, we're not interested in finding Jewish traditions. Yes, but we may be interested in binding some of our own traditions, which is the same thing, and we need to realize that that's not part of the gospel either, and separate what the gospel is from what the gospel is not. So he says, am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God, or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. And uh, he tells in chapter 6, verses 12 and 13, as we've just mentioned about these other men who were really not trying to please Christ by what they were doing, but trying to gain the approval of men. A slave of Christ does what he does because Christ asked him to do it. Why was Paul preaching to the Gentiles? Because Christ compelled him to do it. Uh, why, was, why was he even preaching the gospel in the first place? Because he was compelled by Christ uh, to do it. So um, Paul was a slave of Christ. And that's what he was calling these other people to be. Then he says, I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel that I preach, and notice this, this theme of the gospel, you know, if we back up here uh, a little bit earlier, verses uh, 8 and 9, he talks about preaching a gospel other than that which we preached, or other than that which you received. And uh, earlier, back to verse 6, where he says, you know, you're, you're deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. For people that were distorting the gospel of Christ. And now he's getting back down here to the gospel which I preach down here in verse 11. So he says, I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel that I preached, see, the gospel that Paul preached was a gospel about the grace of Christ. It was the gospel of Christ. Christ was the theme of Christ was the center. Christ was the heart of everything that Paul preached. So he says the gospel that I preach is not something that man made up. It didn't come from man. And remember how the book began back there in verse 1 where he says, Paul an apostle, not from man, not through man, but through God the Father, through Jesus Christ. So this gospel that Paul was preaching 
is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man. Now again, that word receive is important. See? Because when you receive it, it's like receiving a tradition. If you receive a tradition from men, that's one thing. But if you receive a divine tradition, that's another thing. Remember like Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 says, For I received from the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. How that uh, in the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, etc. Or in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, doesn't he say, uh, I received from the Lord of first importance that which also I delivered unto you. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So this gospel was not something received as a tradition from man, like the Mishnaic traditions or the Pharisaic traditions. He did not, was not taught it by man. He goes to great lengths about this. He even goes to great lengths to show that he was not taught it by the Jerusalem apostles. He was not only not taught it by man, he wasn't even taught it by other Christians, you know, uh, other apostles. He was taught it by Christ primarily. Now, Ananias came to him and originally taught him the gospel and baptized him. But Christ revealed the implications of the gospel to Paul. He says, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Again, this was a matter of compulsion. This was divine revelation uh, that brought this message of grace to Paul that ran so counter to the traditions of Judaism. A message of grace which didn't require people to wear tassels on their garments or be circumcised or observe the Sabbath day or to uh, do Passover or uh, to go to Jerusalem with the sacrifices or to do any of those things which many people expected other people to do. But he said, I didn't get this from man. I got it directly from Jesus Christ. Then he says, For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism. Now, uh, this word manner of life is an important word. It's the word anastrophe. You see it there in red? Anastrophe. Yes. And, and also notice the little word once, pote, there. Paul often uses that little word, P-O-T-E, pote, to refer to the situation formerly, before he was a Christian. He uses that all through Ephesians. He uses that here in Galatians. But his manner of life once, that is, before he became a Christian, is different than his manner of life now. See? Uh, uh, it's sort of like uh, he, he uses that uh, in Ephesians 2, for example, where he says... Uh, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once lived according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the powers of the air. And then he, he says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near through the blood of Christ. So he uses that once and now. He does it many of his epistles. He does it in the book of Romans. But that's very important here in this verse. He's talking about his manner of life, his conduct once in Judaism as opposed to now. Now, this manner of life, this word anastrophe, is a word that is, is used in, in some books of the New Testament even thematically as your manner of conduct, your manner of life. And uh, this would include the whole nine yards of how you dress, how you eat, who you associate with, how you talk, etc. And for Paul, not only did it include being a Hebrew of Hebrews, and a Pharisee, but it included uh, persecuting the church of God. Yeah, and Paul is putting this in here because not only was he a Jew and a strong Jew and a passionate Jew, but he was persecuting the very thing that now he was preaching. Of course, you remember Acts 8, 1 through 4, where there arose on that day a great persecution against the church that was in Jerusalem. And uh, Saul laid waste the church, and entering into every house, dragging men and women, he committed them to prison. First Timothy 1.13, I was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, howbeit I did it ignorantly and in unbelief. So these things were very, very important in uh, uh, what Paul was trying to get across to the church here, uh, the churches in Galatia, that not only did he... Uh, passionately pursued Judaism, but he passionately pers persecuted the very thing that he was now preaching. 
So he said, I persecuted it beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And everybody knew that he did. And nobody doubted that he did. And his own personal testimony uh, was very, very powerful in that regard. So notice, notice it talks about Judaism here. You have Juda Judaism, Judaism. It's interesting that at this point, Paul sees Judaism as a separate thing from Christianity and the gospel of Christ. Because Judaism as a religious practice was obsolete. And Christianity was God's plan. But of course Christianity came out of Judaism. It was the natural fulfillment of Judaism. But Judaism was what was going on once and not now, not since Jesus Christ. Notice here, just for grins, I persecuted the church of God. Ecclesia unto Thayu. We should be accustomed and we should often use different terms, biblical terms for the church. It's not just the church of Christ, it's the church of God, it's the church of the firstborn. Uh, it's, it's all of the biblical names for the church and we should use those very freely. And Paul said, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions, the traditions of my fathers. Now this word tradition is another word I want you to remember. This is the word that goes with that word received. You know, paralambano means to receive from. Paradoseon, which is from paradidomi. Those of you that, that read Greek, paradidomi is the basic word. Paradoseon is tradition. But that means to pass down, to hand down, to pass along. So a tradition is something passed down. Okay? Somebody passes it down. The key question is who passed it down? Did it come from God or man? If it's a divine tradition that was received by the apostles from God, then we hold to that tradition. If it was a human tradition, like the Mishnahic traditions, then we don't have to hold to those traditions. So two words that go together in this discussion are Tradition, which means to pass down, and the word receive, which means to receive from. That's the two ends of the tradition. There's the one who passes it down, and there's the ones who receive it from. See? And those are the two ideas that are, that are very important here in the idea of, of uh, receiving divine traditions. But Paul was very zealous of the, his previous life of the traditions of the fathers, of the traditions of the Pharisees which you will find in the Mishnah. And uh, he, in fact, was so zealous of those traditions that he earned himself a, a spot in the top court, the Sanhedrin. And remember how he said, I cast my vote against them. Uh, he, was, he was one of the ones that were making the decisions, that were sitting with the most prominent Pharisees and Sadducees. And he had really earned him a spot and, and respect and prestige and all the rest among the people uh, of Judaism. Uh, Paul likely was not there when Jesus Christ stood before the Sanhedrin and was denounced and, and voted down, but Saul of Tarsus probably was there not very many years after that uh, in the Sanhedrin, certainly at the time of, of Stephen's death, perhaps, and, and uh, later on he said, I cast my vote. So certainly Paul had a part in this. Okay, uh, I want to open up the floor for a question or two and maybe give us a, a short break here in a minute. Does anyone on that end have a question that you would like to ask? <clears throat> have to speak up if you do. No question? Anybody on this end? Nobody? Okay. What we are going to do then is uh, we are going to um, take a little five-minute break here, and we'll come back. So take five minutes, come back in a very few.
fine. Can you see me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Are you guys keeping up all right? Going too fast? No, sir. Three screen and the and just him all the time doing that. We haven't we haven't normally had. Okay. All right. So we're good to go there. Okay. What's that Greek word again? The word see. How do you pronounce that? The word received is is uh, paralambano. Paralambano. That's an important word in a lot of Paul's letters. In this place, it's two hours. Oh, two two hours. Today. Usually it'll be three. Yeah. Uh, everybody understands that today we're getting out at, uh, I guess it's 10 o'clock your time, right? Yes. And 11 o'clock my time. So uh, then 
what will happen in previous, or not previous, but future classes will be that we'll break for chapel at 10 o'clock and we'll come back at 10.45 or 11.45 our time. So from 11 to 11.45, the guys here will have lunch, come back, and have another hour after that. <clears throat> kind of gets weird when you're dealing with different time zones. All right, let's go ahead and fire back up here. Anybody have any questions you'd like to ask in the meantime? Okay, I'm going to take that as a no. This uh, picture that you have up here in front of you is the synagogue. I believe this is uh, the synagogue at Capernaum. And uh, Paul's past and many of these people's past and present was being spent in places like this, the synagogue, the place of uh, local teaching and preaching in Judaism. The interior of synagogues like this is very interesting. Usually the seating in the synagogue was around the edges of the building as opposed to in the center of the building like ours are. You see the little bleacher type seating that goes all around the walls? And the people would sit all around the walls like this and uh, then a lot, a lot of times there was an upper deck and they would sit around the, the upper deck in the same fashion. And of course the, uh, the Torah... The reading of the law and the prophets was central in the synagogue service. As we said before, there would be a reading of the Torah and a reading of the Nabi'im or the prophets every time, and preaching would be done on those things. Uh, scrolls like this one, which is uh, the Isaiah scroll. Remember in Luke chapter 4, verse 16, it talks about Jesus being in Nazareth, and it says they handed to, them, to him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and he stood up to read and he read what now is Isaiah 61, 1 through 3 the spirit of the Lord is upon me but this is the kind of, of scroll that would have been handed to Jesus uh, to open up and read in the synagogue at Nazareth and remember in the synagogue at Antioch of Pisidia where Paul was uh, listening to the reading of the law and the prophets and then after the readings which have been from scrolls like this uh, he was asked to speak about what had been read. Uh, the Jewish traditions of all kinds would have been very familiar and sacred to the, the people that Paul was writing to, especially those that were so uh, into Judaism and coming out of Jewish backgrounds, where some of them were coming out of Gentile backgrounds, which were, uh, posed problems. But the phylacteries, the little chests where they would put scriptures, uh, all of these things were Jewish traditions which were very common to the Jews, not to the Gentiles, very sacred to the Jews, not to the Gentiles, not part of the gospel at all. You see the phylacteries here, these little boxes that they would keep little rolled up passages of scriptures on and keep them on their persons to remind them of scriptures. And these kind of uh, things Jesus talks about in Matthew 23 that were traditions of Pharisees. Okay. Now, very important passage. We get down to Galatians chapter 1, verse 15. Paul says, But when it pleased the one who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him to the Gentiles, immediately I did not confer with flesh and blood. You all know the story of Saul on the road to Damascus. Let's diagnose or diagram this sentence right here. Uh, in the book of Galatians. Uh, there's so much to talk about here. If you uh, turn back, for example, to Jeremiah, the first chapter. I know it's in here somewhere. Jeremiah chapter 1. I think it's about verse 5 or so. Verse 4, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart or separated you. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. It seems like Paul is taking a passing slap at that scripture here. 
when he says, But when it pleased him who separated me from my mother's womb, just like God chose Jeremiah from his mother's womb to be a prophet to the nations. Notice where at the end of Jeremiah 1 5, a prophet to the nations. What's another word for nations? Like the Greek word for nations is the same as what? Gentiles. And of course, Paul was chosen to be an apostle to the Gentiles. And he seems to uh, identify very well with what Jeremiah says in uh, uh, Jeremiah 1, verse 4 and 5, uh, talking about his calling uh, to his mission, Paul's similar calling to his mission. Notice that I have underlined the segments of this verse that are the guts of the sentence. This is a really long sentence that you can get confused at. But this is the essence of the sentence. When he was pleased to reveal his son in me, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. Now that's the essence of what Paul is trying to say. In other words, when God finally revealed, revealed Christ to me, I didn't talk to anybody else, any other humans, that taught me stuff. That's, that's what he's trying to say. And when he was pleased to reveal his son in me, is on the road to Damascus. God revealed Christ to Paul. And the reason God did that was that I might preach him among the Gentiles. See? The very purpose for God's calling Paul was to have his missionary to the Gentiles. Acts 9.15 Jesus told Ananias, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel to me to bear my name before the Gentiles, before the king, before the children of Israel. So God was pleased to reveal Christ to Paul so that he might preach him among the Gentiles. And when that happened, see, Paul said, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. I didn't get brainwashed by uh, anybody that made me do anything. See, uh, Instead, when that happened, you see, I, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to the apostles who were before me. Didn't even go see the James, the Lord's brother, or any of those. But I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Now, a lot of people have uh, theorized about this uh, period here. But if you look at Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 9, let's look over about verse 23. In Acts chapter 9. talks about after Paul left Damascus. It says, after many days had gone by, we don't know how many days that is, the Jews conspired to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. And when he came to Jerusalem, now see, Paul says he did not go to Jerusalem after his conversion, but he went away to Arabia and came back to uh, Damascus. But after he leaves Damascus here in Acts chapter 9, he goes to Jerusalem. So it seems to me that in Acts 9.23, where it says after many days had gone by, it seems to me that you've got at least how long right there? Anybody want to say three years? Let's look at the, how this is placed together. He says, Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Then three years later I went up to Jerusalem. See? So what this... Some people have said, well, now, where is this three years that Paul spent in uh, Arabia? Well, the text does not say that he spent three years in Arabia. The text says, if you if you uh, go back, it says, I went away to Arabia and returned to Damascus. He may have spent two weeks in Arabia. We don't know how long he spent in Arabia. He returned to Damascus. Then three years later, see, after he left Damascus, he went to Jerusalem. And that's exactly what happens in Acts chapter 9, verse 23. It says, after many days... He just doesn't mention the trip over to Arabia in Acts chapter 9. 
Primarily during that three years he was in Damascus. That's in Syria, not in Arabia. So then three years later he said, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas. Now, the Greek word there is uh, uh, historesi. Historesi. We get the word history, by the way, from that word. And it means to inquire accurately of, to ask him some things, to talk to him about some things. And uh, it means more than to become acquainted with him. You can check some other, excuse me, other translations there. Hysteresi is the word. Cephas, of course, is Peter. And it's interesting that here he uses Peter's Aramaic name instead of his Greek name, Petros. He uses Cephas, Kephas, which means a rock or a stone. But uh, he, he uses the Aramaic terminology as that's his Jewishness coming out and maybe making a few points with the Jewish readers who would have called him Kephas or Cephas instead of uh, Peter. And he stayed with Peter 15 days. That's roughly two weeks. But I did not see any of the other apostles except James the Lord's brother. Now, think with me for a minute. In Acts 12... James, the apostle, the brother of John, the, uh, you know, the sons of Zebedee, uh, he got killed. In Acts 15, James, who was the leader of the Jerusalem conference, that was James, the Lord's brother, who also was the brother of Jude and Simon and Joseph, who wrote the book of James, the brother of the guy who wrote the book of Jude. Here in verse 19... James, the Lord's brother, is called an apostle. So, you know, Paul was an apostle. He wasn't one of the twelve. This seems to say that James, the Lord's brother, also came to be an apostle. He wasn't one of the twelve. Well, how did that happen? Well, how did it happen with Paul? Who made Paul an apostle? Christ did on the road to Damascus. And if James was an apostle, I guess the same person made James an apostle. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning with verse 4, And Christ raised from the dead the third day according to the Scriptures, and He appeared unto Cephas, and then to the twelve, and then He appeared to above five hundred brothers at once, of whom the greater part remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James, and then to the rest of the apostles, and last of all, as unto a child untimely born, He appeared to me. So James got a post-resurrection appearance from Christ, sort of like Paul did. And in Acts chapter 1, at the end of the book of Acts, who's up there waiting in that upper room for the coming of the day of Pentecost? Or excuse me, at the beginning of the book of Acts. Who's waiting in the upper room? But Jesus' mother and his who else? His brothers. And his brothers, according to Matthew 13, 55, were James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, or Jude, who wrote the book of Jude. They don't like to call him Judas because that guy, there was lots of Judases, sort of like there were lots of Jesuses. Did you know that Josephus talks about like 22 different guys named Jesus? And included in that 22 is this one Jesus of Nazareth that everybody's so concerned about. There were all kinds of Judases in Judea too, and Jesus' brother was one of them. But politically, they decided they wouldn't call it the book of Judas. That just rang people's bells wrong, and so they called him Jude instead of Judas. You look in your Greek text and see if it doesn't say Judas. Okay. Anybody want to ask anything about any of that? Okay. <laughs> All right, so I didn't see any of the other apostles except James and the Lord's brother. Now, why is he going into this? Because if you go back to verse 11 and 12, he said, I didn't receive this from man. I wasn't taught it. But it came to me by revelation from Jesus Christ. I didn't even get it from another apostle. I got it from Christ himself. And so he says in verse 20, Now, in what I am writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying. Then... And I take this then to be, after his initial visit to Jerusalem, his two-week visit to Jerusalem, where he saw Cephas and he saw James, the Lord's brother. 
Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. Now, what is the main city in Syria? Of course, there was Damascus, but in the New Testament, what is the main city in Syria that Paul was associated with? I can't hear you. Antioch. Antioch. Antioch of Syria. Remember in Acts 11, when they came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. In fact, if you'll, if you'll go to Acts 11 with me here real quick. Acts 11, verse 19. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to the Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to uh, speak to the Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. So you see... Uh, the same area is being talked about here, Antioch. And then, of course, it was from, from Antioch that Barnabas went to Tarsus and got Saul and brought him back to Antioch and gathered there and taught the people. So Paul went to Syria and Cilicia in the Acts narrative at Acts chapter 11 and so forth. And then from Antioch, after he'd been to Antioch for who knows how long, then he went to the Galatian area, remember, in Acts 13 and 14, and then in Acts 15 was the Jerusalem Council that says, you know, except you be circumcised, you cannot be saved. And then they had to decide that matter. So that kind of puts this in time perspective when Paul is talking about it. So he says, then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which are in Christ. Now notice that phraseology there. During this time when Paul was over in Antioch there, working with Barnabas, he was still basically an unknown. Now, back in Acts 9, uh, the, the apostles had been very reluctant to receive Paul. Barnabas has introduced him to the apostles briefly. But to the churches in Judea, basically, he was unknown by sight. Notice how he puts this about the church. The churches of Judea, which were in Christ. The churches, that means the assemblies. The assemblies. A church is an assembly. This is a basic definition. A church is a group of people that meets together for worship on Sunday. That's the basic defining element for a church. An assembly. An ecclesia. It, it, it does mean, uh, the etymology of the word does go back to the meaning called out. But the first century meaning of ecclesia was a group, a gathering, or an assembly. These assemblies in Judea, there were all kinds of assemblies in Judea. By the, word, by the way, the word synagogue, synagogue or synagogue means to gather together. It means an assembly. So ecclesia and synagogue are really the same thing, see? So there were some assemblies in Judea which were not in Christ. They were meeting in synagogues, but they were not in Christ. And there were other assemblies in Judea who were in Christ. See? And what we want to make sure of is that we are part of an assembly that is in Christ. See? What is a church? It's an assembly. But it's this particular church in Jesus Christ. See, that's the point here. So he was unknown by sight to the assemblies of Judea, which are in Christ, the churches of Judea, which are in Christ. I just think it's very interesting that he words it that way. He doesn't say the churches of Christ in Judea. He says the assemblies in Judea, the churches of Judea, which are in Christ. That implies that there are churches that are not in Christ, doesn't it? What's a church? It's a group. It's a gathering. It's an assembly. So there are lots of assemblies that are not in Christ, and there are some assemblies that are in Christ. And he was unknown to those at this point. He says, but only they kept hearing, he who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. Notice that little word once again in uh, that passage. And that's the little word pote, which we had back in chapter 1 and uh, verse, uh, let's see here, where was it? Verse 13, where he said, you heard of my manner of life once in Jerusalem, 
verse 13. He says, uh, this is the same word that he uses here. He once persecuted us. And that is in contrast to now. He's preaching the faith. Now, here's something I want you to dwell on for a minute. Earlier in the passage, and I think I've got the Greek text of this up here. If you'll notice the Greek text here, it says he now preaches the faith. The word preaches there is euangelizo, which is usually the word that we translate preaching the good news. Okay? But you'll notice tain pistain is in the accusative. Those of you that have had some Greek. How many of you in there have had Greek already in one form or another? Nearly everybody? Okay. So you'll notice tain pistain down there is in the accusative case. That means it's the direct object. That means it's the thing that is being preached. So he's now preaching the faith. Earlier in the passage, he said they, he was preaching the gospel. Now he's preaching the faith. It, this shows that the faith and the gospel are interchangeable. The faith is that, that core teaching about Jesus Christ and redemptive work of Christ and how we're saved and, and how a man comes to inherit that salvation and how we maintain fellowship with God. That's the faith. And the faith, the gospel that Paul preached, is a gospel of grace. It's a gospel of Christ. It's not a gospel of law. It's not a gospel of works. But I want you to notice the use of the term faith here. It's an object. It is a body of teaching. It's a body of received tradition which was received from God by Paul and preached by him to the Gentiles. So earlier we're you on the lids of mine we're, we're preaching the gospel. Now we're preaching the faith. Same, same. And once he persecuted the faith, that was the faith of Christianity. Faith in Christ. The people who were followers in Christ. Anybody want to ask any questions? You guys are a quiet bunch. That, mean, that means that you guys are all so smart that you don't have any questions at all. Or it could mean something also very scary that I don't even want to think about. Sure nobody has any questions? <laughs> Anybody on this end have any questions? Okay. Very good. Now this map that you're going to see now on the screen... Uh, shows how that in due time here, Paul went down to Jerusalem, to the great council at Jerusalem. And let's let's turn our Bibles just a minute over to Acts 15. We've followed him through being raised up at the feet of Gamaliel and rising to prominence where he became a member of the Sanhedrin court and uh, his experience on the Damascus Road, and then his three years in Arabia and Damascus, and his brief visit to Jerusalem, and then his work in Antioch, and finally his early missionary work with Barnabas out in the churches of Galatia. Now in Acts 15, verse 1, some men came down from Judah, or Judea, to Antioch. See, Paul, where did Paul get sent to Galatia from? Antioch. Where did Paul return to after preaching in Galatia? Antioch. And if you go back to uh, Acts 14, verse 26, from Italia they sailed back to Antioch where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. And on arriving there, that is in Antioch, Syria, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he, God, had opened a door of faith unto the Gentiles. So 15.1, some men came down from Judea to Antioch. See, they came from the, the beginning point of the church. They came from the church headquarters in Judea. And they began teaching the brothers, unless you were circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. And this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. Now, this is interesting to me because 
For one reason, the word elders here is a word that deserves some study. If you're talking in the context of the church, that means appointed leaders of a congregation. If you're talking in the context of Judaism, that means leaders among the people of some sort. It's difficult when reading this passage in Acts 15 to determine exactly what sense the word elder is being used here in. Because there are lots of Jews involved in this and Jewishness involved in this. And uh, it's doubly confusing because in Philemon verse 9, Paul is called Paul the Elder, for example. And in 1 Peter 5 verse 1, Peter is an elder. And in 2 John verse 1 and 3 John verse 1, John is called John the Elder. And they were also apostles, but they were elders, perhaps in the congregational sense, but certainly in the Jewish sense that they were leaders among the people, the recognized leaders of the people. You think back to when the um, chief priests and the elders came to talk to Jesus. Who was that? What does that mean, the elders? Uh, when in the Old Testament it talks about the elders of Israel, who were those guys? You know. So all I'm telling you is that, that the word elder here in Acts is in sort of a state of flux. Certainly in Acts 14 at the end in 22 and 23, Paul and Barnabas ordained elders in every church for the Christian communities there. But this was still in a time when there was a state of flux between Christianity and Judaism and the lines were blurred and in these conferences like in Jerusalem and in the books like Book of Galatians, the lines were being clarified between Judaism and Christianity and between uh, one culture and the other. Just thought I'd throw that out and just remember as you study the word elder that as you study in different passages and contexts, you may be reading it in the Jewish sense, you may be reading it in the, in the Christian sense, and you kind of have to let uh, context determine which one that is. So, who were the elders in Jerusalem? Were they the appointed elders of the Jerusalem church? Maybe so. Or were they the recognized leaders of the church? Whether apostle or elder or whatever. Did the Jerusalem church at first have elders? Or were the apostles functioning as the elders? As a six? Uh, don't know. I'm just throwing those things up into the air. So here, um, this council convenes at Jerusalem, and you know how the different ones got up and spoke, and how James, the Lord's brother, ended up being like E.F. Hutton. When he speaks, everybody hushes up, and he had the last word at the council and said, we're not going to bind anything further on the Gentiles but these necessary things. And if they had just taken that and let that do that, everything would have been fine, and Paul may not have had the right the book of Galatians, but saying it, living it, is two different things. And Paul, of course, spoke before the elders and the apostles in the Jerusalem Council. He didn't speak a whole lot, but if you look down here at uh, verse 12 of Acts 15, the whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. See, that showed that it wasn't Paul and Barnabas' idea, but it was God. It was the work of God that was going on. And that's all you get. And when they finished, James spoke up and said, Brothers, listen to me. And everybody did. See, it's a historical fact that the primary and prominent leader of the Jewish church came to be James, the Lord's brother. Why that was? Who knows? Other people went other places for mission work, but very quickly, James, the Lord's brother, came to be the prominent voice of the Jerusalem church. And even in Galatians chapter 2, it says, when some brethren came down from James, you know, it's like James was the, was the main spokesman, the main leader there. For perhaps not officially, but certainly at least unofficially. And in Galatians 1.19, James is called a what? Anybody been awake over there? Apostle. He's called an apostle. That's right. So he was he was not only the Lord's brother, he was called an apostle. Okay, anybody want to ask any questions at this point? 
So here's what I've got as far as the history of the sequence of Paul's life before we uh, get into this. First, you have his life in Judaism uh, before his uh, conversion to Christianity. Then you get to Galatians 1.15 where it says, When it pleased him to reveal his son in me. See, when, when the Damascus Road thing happened. Then after the Damascus Road incident, it says that Paul went to Arabia and then he returned to Damascus. And there was a three-year period there, see, where he stayed in Damascus. Then there was a brief visit to Jerusalem that was two weeks long. And then he went to uh, Tarsus, stayed a while. And then he joined Barnabas in Antioch of Syria and preached there for a while. And then he went to southern Galatia in Acts 13 and 14 and preached there a while. And then he returned to Antioch after that mission trip. And then in Acts 15, 1, he went up to Jerusalem for the Jerusalem Council. And that may be the same time where he goes up to Jerusalem uh, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 1. He says, Then after an interval of 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem. That would mean that between Acts 11, where you have uh, Paul working in uh, Antioch, uh, and Acts 15, you have at least 14 years that passes in those chapters. And so there was quite a long time that passes by in, uh, in that Acts narrative, about 14 years worth. Okay? So he says, Then after an interval of 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. And it was because of a revelation that I went up, or I went up according to revelation. It's, it's actually the phrase kata apocalypse according to revelation and according to revelation modifies the word I went up in other words it was because of the revelation that he went to Jerusalem God told him to go to Jerusalem in other words he went up because God wanted him to go there and take part in the conference so he took Barnabas who was his partner in crime in preaching to the Gentiles but he also took Titus to Jerusalem and Titus was a Gentile. See? Titus was a Gentile. He was, he was a Greek. So this is very significant as a real life example. Here's Titus who's a Gentile and he's a Christian and he's going up there to the heart of Judaism. Now Titus doesn't practice Jewish customs. Titus is a Gentile. He, he lives like a Gentile. But Paul and Barnabas who were both raised Jews, are going up there with all these Judaizers into the heart of Judaism, and they're taking a Gentile with them who doesn't act like a Jew. Think they did that on purpose? He wasn't a Jew, but what was he? Anybody? Christian. He was a Christian. He was a baptized believer. He was, he was one who had obeyed the gospel of Christ. And if what Paul was preaching was true, he didn't need to be a Jew. All he needed to be was a Christian. And the only thing he needed to worry about was being a Christian and not the traditions that might have been attached to uh, Judaism. Okay. Yes. yes. Now, it, <clears throat> you said, well, it also says here in verse 2 that uh, he went to Jerusalem because God told him, but Back in Acts 15, I don't know if you said this, but did I miss it? It said that, you know, that the church sent him. So basically, was there two reasons he went? Because God sent him? Because the church sent him? Yeah, I mean, how does God, how does God do what God does? He does it in different ways, but the answer is both things were true. The church sent him. The church probably paid their way and sent him up there. But God said, go to Jerusalem. So he went. So it's a matter of both and. Okay? Anybody else want to ask a question? <coughs> you got you got your chance, everybody. No. Okay. So this was a case in point. This was a real life study of this. Now this is a very key passage uh, that we're looking at here in, in chapter two. Uh, 
And he says when he went up there with Titus, he says, And I submitted to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. Now if you go back through the book of Galatians to the word gospel, let's just do this for a minute. You go back to chapter 1, verse 6. I marvel that you're so quickly removing yourself from the one who called you in the grace of Christ unto a different gospel. And then Galatians 1, verse 7, some would pervert the gospel of Christ. Then verse 8 and 9, anybody that preaches any other gospel than that which we preach to you, and uh, any gospel other than that which you receive, verse 9. Uh, verse 11 of chapter 1, uh, the gospel that is preached by me is not after man. And then in, in uh, 116, that I may preach the gospel about him among the Gentiles. And then again, in chapter 2, verse 2, the gospel that I preach. But see, the gospel that Paul preached was the gospel of the grace of Christ. It was not like this different gospel that these other people were preaching that was not about the grace of Christ. So he says, I submitted to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but I did so in private to those who were of reputation. Now, this word, uh, those who are of reputation is a word which means approval or approved. And it seems to be uh, referring to those who were approved as bona fide leaders in everybody's eyes. And later on we're going to learn that these included Peter, James, and John. These were the pillars, the, the supports, that everybody recognized that these were great leaders of the church that everybody should listen to. So these were the people that Paul met with privately and he said, look, I want you to know the gospel that I've been preaching. Here's what I've been saying. And he said, I did this for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. Now you say, well, why would Paul be afraid of that if Paul was an apostle and he was uh, inspired by God? Well, Paul was human and these people were coming from Judea and they were powerful Jewish people that were well respected and they were coming down here saying, except you be circumcised, you cannot be saved. And they were making powerful rabbinic arguments and everything. And, and Paul was human. And just like John the Baptist, who was a prophet of God, uh, asked Jesus again, are you the Christ or should I look for somebody else? He had his doubts, you know, the doubts crept in. So maybe Paul was beginning to kind of question himself a little bit on this and say, you know, I know I'm right. And I've, I've done what Christ has told me, but could it be that I'm doing something wrong here? And, and he began to be fearful of this. And so he said, well, surely the apostles of Christ will tell me if I'm doing something wrong. This is the passage we really want to center in on here, verse 3. He says, but not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Now, this is a key word in the study of Galatians. It's the word that is in the aorist passive there, anakaste, but the lexical form is what I give you down at the bottom of the screen, anakadzo, anakadzo. That's the word that means to force or compel. That means to require it of somebody, to make them do it. In other words, if you don't do this, I'm not going to accept you. We're going to make you do this. We're not letting you in here unless you do this. See? To compel, to force. Anakadzo. So Titus was not compelled to be circumcised. That doesn't mean that the people did not try to force him to be circumcised. They did try to force him to be circumcised. But Titus was not giving in to their compulsion. He was not going to allow them to compel him. Now, if you flip over to uh, Galatians 6, Galatians 6, you have this same word in verse 12, Galatians 6, verse 12, where it says, They wish to make a fair showing in the flesh, those who compel you, anakadzo, compel you to be circumcised. This is the same word you have here and the same word you have over in Galatians chapter 6. And Paul's book of Galatians is largely about 
trying to compel or force people to do something that Christ has not compelled or forced them to do. We in our churches today often are guilty of trying to compel or force people to conform to certain traditions we have, which are things that Christ and the gospel has not compelled them to do. And so we can be guilty of, of doing the same things. The question has to be, what is it that we've received from Christ? And in what way are we going beyond that in compelling people to do things that we have not received from Christ? If we've received it from Christ, if Christ has commanded it, we're compelled to do it. If he hasn't commanded it, then we're not compelled to do it. And they were trying to compel or force Titus to do this. This word is used uh, a number of times, several times, but if you'll go over to verse 14 of Galatians 2, you find this word again. Paul's talking about what Peter pulled there in uh, Antioch. It says, but when I saw that he was not, they were not plotting a straight course for the truth of the gospel, uh, I said to Cephas in front of them all, if you being a Jew live like a Gentile and do not live like a Jew. Now here's the key part. How is it that you compel or force the Gentiles to act like Jews? That's that same word. Hmm. Key word in the book of Galatians. Anagkazo. To compel or force. And you need to know every place where that occurs in the book of Galatians. So that you can tell me what they are and what the circumstance was and uh, what the meaning of it was. Now let's uh, breathe for a second here and, and let me wrap up a few things here in the next five minutes. As in all my classes, I'm interested in two things. I'm interested, yes, in sharing some material with you about the book of Galatians, but more than that, I'm interested in helping you with exegetical method and learning how to tear the text apart and really approach the text of Scripture. Anytime you study a book, you study it like you haven't studied it before, you're looking for words and phrases and ideas that recur in the text. I think you can see in the, in the uh, uh, first couple of chapters in Galatians that the term gospel is a key term. It occurs over and over and over again. The gospel preached by me, a different gospel, perverting the gospel. You know, the gospel I submitted to them, the gospel that I preached. The gospel and the whole idea of what the gospel is, is a basic concept in the book of Galatians. This word compelled is a key word. It's not just a key word because I say it's a key word. It's a key word because it figures in different stories and it figures in the conclusion of the book. And it figures in why the book was written. That these people were trying to compel or force something that Christ had not compelled. And it presents a, a basic question to us. What is it that we have the right to compel people to do? One brother there brought up the matter of baptism. We have the right to compel people to baptize and it's not we that compel them to be baptized. It's Christ that compels them. The reason we compel that is because that's enjoined on us by Christ. See, Christ said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, he that believes and is baptized. Christ said, Go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Christ gave that to us. We've received it from Christ. But what about compelling people to wear a suit or they can't wait on the Lord's table? Or, you know, we could go on and on and compel. And, uh, you know, we'll talk later and when we really get into some application discussion, uh, some elderships feel that they have the right to compel people to do certain things just because they're elders. I would question that right. Elders don't have the right to compel anybody to do anything that Christ hasn't compelled them to do. The job of elders is to teach Christ and the, and the teachings of Christ not to enjoin laws that God hasn't enjoined. So, anyway, this will kind of give you something about the direction we're headed. And uh, we're going to be noting uh, a lot of things recurring in the book of Galatians. Anybody, did, did your bell ring already? <laughs>
Yes. Okay. We will see you Thursday at 8 o'clock. Thank you. Okay, God bless. Thanks, man. Bye, Dennis. We'll see you. All right.